If you want to open your Bibles up with me to Hebrews chapter 1. This morning we are going to go without the slides because the projector needs uh, its fan or the uh, filter clean so it shuts off and gets overheating there. So we'll get that fixed this week. But, so you have to pay attention and maybe write a couple verses down because we're going to look in a few different places today. And uh, so I invite you to, to, to turn with me to some of those spots and others we'll just read and you can look at later. But today uh, we'll be talking a little bit about angels. You know, every night as a kid... I would uh, pray a prayer similar to this. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Angels watch me through the night, wake me with the morning light. Something like that anyway. And I know there's different versions of that, but we, uh, we prayed that as a kid. And this whole idea was send angels to watch over me while I sleep. And this was something that we just prayed and didn't think much about. But there is in our culture a fascination with supernatural things. You can look all over the place and see that. Uh, it just fascinates people. Even among unbelievers, you will find that the topic of angels is a very popular one for most people. Angels are depicted everywhere. I mean, uh, we've movies. I mean, remember in the like uh, late 90s, there was a movie called Angels in the Outfield. Remember that one? That was more from when I was a kid, right? But a bunch of angels come and they fix this baseball team, the Anaheim Angels so that this kid's home life could be fixed, and it was kind of a cute, fun movie. Is that really what angels do? Like, is that real? It's a Wonderful Life. Familiar with that one, right? Every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. <clears throat> is that true? There's lots of ideas. You walk into any Hallmark store, and there's angel figurines everywhere, Right? all over the place, and necklaces and trinkets and things you can hang from your car mirror as a way to guard your car and that kind of thing. Sometimes good luck charms and all kinds of things. Is that true? And of course, some people will tell us that they are angels and how they behave. And of course, we know if they have to tell us that, that's probably not the case. We use it all the time. We talk about this. This is part of our culture. But... What is it like? People also believe, and maybe, maybe you believe this, uh, or have believed this at some point in your life, that when we die, we become angels. And that's also a popular idea, like floating around in our clouds, you know, strumming our harps, maybe throwing in a chorus or two of hallelujah chorus here and there or something. But uh, is that what really happens? You know, from, from time to time, they do these studies, and they ask people questions, and you can take what you will from it. But one of the things they did was ask about angels. And how many believe in angels? And of the people they surveyed, like 77% of the people that they surveyed at least believed in angels, regardless of their faith, regardless of what they, what they thought in terms of God. 55% believe in guardian angels. So there's this spiritual sense, there's this interest, there's these ideas, and that's why I want to talk about it in this series. The series we've been in is called What About That? Last week we looked at hell. We looked at heaven the week before that. And uh, just looking at some things that get misunderstood and maybe not talked about very much that we need to know. So that's where we're going to be today. Um, we're going to go to the Bible and see what the Bible says. This is very cursory in its, in its understanding today of, of what angels are. Okay, we're not going to get into every nuance and detail. But I'm hoping that as we kind of look at this buffet of scriptures today in a way that you will be encouraged to look further on your own, for one. Secondly, further on your own and other things, other doctrines of our faith that we don't think too much about as well. So we're going to answer three questions today. What are angels? What do angels do? And why do I care about angels? So we're going to go to different places today, like I said, so you might want to write some of these down. But we're going to start in Hebrews chapter 1. And that's where we're going to be the foundation, the backbone, if you will, of this message today is Hebrews chapter 1. And we're going to shore up our understanding here a little bit of this. So Hebrews 1, verse 1 through verse 4. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being 
sustaining all things by his powerful word, after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right uh, hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. So for me, as I think about this topic, that is the one area that I think we need to really grasp, and that is that Jesus is superior. Angels are real, yes, but Jesus is superior. He is the one we worship. So we need to keep things in order. So what are angels? Well, first of all, angels, it says in verse 4, are spiritual beings. And being that they are spiritual, they, we see in Scripture, take on various forms. So for example, you see them maybe looking more like human at times and, and meeting with people that way. Other times you see them looking a little more uh, angelic, that's the word, right? <laughs> Cherubim, seraphim, we see this in, for example, Isaiah chapter 6. And I'll, I'll read this section here, Isaiah chapter 6. And uh, the throne room of God. So Isaiah enters into the throne room of God and he is immediately overwhelmed with this presence of God and with this experience and all that's going on there. It says this, In the year King Uzziah died, saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. That's Isaiah 6, 1 through 5. So we see in this, this different picture of angels, right? Wings and various different wings and kind of this magnificent, overwhelming scene. You notice the doorposts and the threshold shook as they worshiped the Lord and smoke filled the room and it was pretty intense. It might make you notice that they're there. Isaiah's response here was, of course, one that maybe is normal in this setting. Woe is me, I am ruined. Of course, he wasn't ruined. God was calling him to service. God was taking someone broken and making him uh, into a servant of his. And isn't that like God to do that? Is it for us as well? So angels are spiritual beings. Angels are spiritual beings that God created. We see this, for example, in Psalm 148, verse 2 through verse 5. <clears throat> Verse, um, 148, 2 to 5, he says, Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. See, God created them. They've not always existed like he has. God had a specific purpose in mind when he created angels. And we also see that there's no more of them being created today. So we don't become angels when we die. Hollywood has made that up, but that's not what the Bible teaches us. Angels are spiritual. They're also personal beings. They have a will. They have emotions. They have intellect. They're very intelligent. One place we see this is kind of a cool place, I think, when, when a sinner decides to follow Jesus. And this celebration that takes place, Luke chapter 15, verse 10, says that there is celebration that takes place in heaven when a sinner repents and turns to Jesus. He says in, uh, let's see, I'll get the verse here, verse 10. I tell you that there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You ever been to a sporting event and you have like the home team scores and everybody goes crazy and they start slapping each other and climbing over each other and the sounds, songs playing and the whole bit? And I was at Gillette Stadium one time. I was there, New England Patriots versus the Green Bay Packers and I was of course rooting for the Packers and um, that was out in New England and the Packers got out in front immediately in the game they expected them not to. We were getting ha hackled, heckled the whole time. 
And uh, the Packers were ahead by a fair amount at the beginning of the game, and it was like a muffled tension, quiet. One time they scored, and I wanted to cheer, and I was like, Ooh. you know, you kind of <laughs> sit on your hands. And uh, don't say it, because you could hear a couple of yeahs here and there along the stadium, but nothing. But then when the home team scored, man, they just, boom, fireworks and confetti, and they're running up and down the, the, the field there and having a great old time. Those kind of scenes are intense, and they're fun, but it's nothing like what the angels do when someone turns to Jesus. It's a party. It's celebration. They are excited. They have emotions. They have experienced joy and sadness and all those kinds of things. Angels make choices as well. We see that in Jude 6. This is where we see some of the picture of what happened uh, with the devil and, and the angels that fell. Jude chapter Jude verse 6 says, And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, these he had kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains, for judgment on the great day. So abandoned God, they were thrown out with the devil, and we call these fallen angels, of course, demons now, but uh, they have wills and emotions and are, have personal uh, minds and that kind of thing. The thing we need to keep in mind, though, is that despite the magnificence of them and the power that they have and all that, that they are limited. They are not God. They are not omnipresent, meaning they can't be everywhere at once. They, they don't know everything. They, they haven't always been. They, they have a will, they have emotions, but they have limits. And that's important to understand. So anyway, that's a very quick snapshot of that. Why do they exist? What do they do? Are they just strumming around on clouds playing harps? Bling, bling. Can, can you get a picture of that? Like, man, that. What do they do? We see them a lot of times in worship. They exist to praise and to glorify God, like you and we, like we do. I mean, really, and we exist to worship God. They worship Him. They're like the worship leaders of heaven, calling us to join in that song of praise, like we saw in Isaiah six. This holy, holy, holy. This constant praise around the throne. If you look at uh, Revelation 5, Revelation 5, verse 11 and 12, here's another really, I think, really amazing scene. Use your imagination here. But at Revelation 5, verse 11 and 12, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. I mean, do the math on that. I mean, they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. So there is this scene around the throne of, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of angels just worshiping the Lord. And they're calling us into that. Isn't that, isn't that fun? When we come together and we sing some songs here, whether you like the songs or not, doesn't matter, right? We plug in to this worship going on around the throne of God. And the angels are leading that, and they are leading that well in this chorus of praise. So that's pretty, pretty amazing, I think. We get to see this Jesus lifted high, and, and we sing songs not as a filler, but as a part of our worship to him. At the birth of Jesus, coming up pretty soon, we celebrate this season again. The Bible describes this chorus of angels as the shepherds out doing shepherd things, tending to their flocks, and boom, angels show up, and they, and they praise the Lord, and they announce his birth. A chorus of angels which actually has another function of this. Not only are they worshipers, but they are messengers. In fact, the, the word angel literally means messenger. God's messengers, and they're messengers called by God like us to obey his word, and they are obeying his will. They need to do what he tells them to do. It's, what, it's God's message to give. They are just the ones to give it, and similar to what we do as we are witnesses of his in the world as well. For example, at the birth of Jesus, Gabriel shows up to Mary. And Mary uh, is surprised because clearly she was not expecting to have a child. But Luke chapter 1, Gabriel shows up and gives a very specific message to Mary. Luke 1, starting in verse 26, 
Sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. But notice Mary's reaction, verse 29. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this could be. It was a little bit scary. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And so there's a startling message, but it was a key part of God's redemptive plan. He had put into motion this redemption of the world through Jesus and it was starting with this message that Gabriel brought to Mary. But you know, that's another example of that later on, right? Joseph hears a similar message in a dream. And, sh- and the angel tells him, hey, relax. Mary's pregnant, you know, but just don't run away. Because it doesn't look good for you, I understand, but, but just trust the Lord and do his work. And so that was a message from God. But while they are messengers, we need to understand that we're not getting new revelation from them. So, uh, for example, Hebrews 1, back to our text for today. I told you we're going to bounce around, so hopefully you're not taking the corners too sharp. But Hebrews chapter 1, it says, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets in the past, but now he spoke to us by his Son. And so we know the, the Bible. We need to know the Bible because the devil also knows the Bible. And he uses it, distorts it, takes a little piece of truth and adds a little bit of not truth, false falsification of that, and makes you believe it. And so we need to realize that uh, the devil has always been one to lie and deceive and try to get people to follow him instead of God. He did this to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 when, when Jesus is out in the wilderness, hungry and weak in the flesh, and the devil comes and says, hey, why don't you worship me and I'll give you bread to eat? Ridiculous. Like, we're like, he's God. Like, why would you do that? It's ridiculous. But why, does, why do we see this? Well, because it's a very helpful warning for us to understand how the devil works, how he tries to distort the truth. I mean, he used the Bible to try to get Jesus to follow him. And, of course, Jesus used the Bible back. And, and of course, he's Jesus and wasn't going to bow down to the devil. But we, he gets us to try to reject the things that we know are true, or at least to distort them a little bit. They look not quite as bad. So we need to understand that about angels, about fallen angels, that there's things that they say. We need to make sure that they are true to what God has told us. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I think this is a great verse for that. 14 and 15 it says, And no wonder, and this is in the context of false prophets, but he says in, in And no wonder, if for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light, it is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness, their end will be what their actions deserve. In other words, don't be surprised when the devil tries to look good. That's what he's always done. So be on guard and know the truth so you can stand on the truth. So what else? They're messengers. Angels also, it says, minister. They are spirits who minister to believers. It says that they have an interest in our well-being. It says right in verse 14, if you go ahead to verse 14 of chapter 1 of Hebrews, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So the writer declares that there are spirits who are sent to minister to believers Those of us born again who trusted in Jesus, who follow him, they exist with a purpose, and the purpose is to minister to us, to serve, to assist, to protect, to do whatever it is the Lord has commanded them to do. I've often wondered this. Haven't you ever wondered this? I've often wondered how many times I've been saved from things, probably most of the times my foolish things, things that I've done that I shouldn't have done, but some of them are spiritual matters, some of them are just carelessness, Like a couple weeks ago, I'm standing, I'm I'm putting the screens up above in the rafters in the garage because it's winter all of a sudden. 
And I'm standing on the edge of the boat doing that because, I mean, why get the ladder? The boat's right there. And um, I, I kind of went back to this, and I, 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 my foot stepped off the side of the boat. And in that moment, I realized I was going to fall, <laughs> and I was going to hit the concrete, and it was going to be painful and maybe, who knows, bad. And, uh, but my hand kind of went up, and I happened to just hit the rafter as I moved, and I was able to catch my balance and put more screens back up there. You know, I didn't learn my lesson. But <laughs> this happens all the time, you know, all the time. Now, is that an angel or is that just, I mean, who knows? I'm not saying that's angels every time that's angels doing that. I'm just saying there are times, based on what the scripture tells us, that we have, inter we have some intervention, so to speak, from uh, those around us protecting us, that kind of thing, intervening on our, our, on our behalf to keep us from hurting ourselves or going someplace we shouldn't go, whatever. <coughs> so that's always, that's always good, because I do a lot of foolish things. Uh, I tried putting the kayak up there the other day, too, by myself. I shouldn't have done that. And, well, anyway, I dropped the kayak, but, but Noah helped me later, so he's tall. See, we do all, I mean, just all the time, just all the time. Another role, less glamorous role, but another role we see in Scripture is judgment. They use by God to execute judgment. One example in the Old Testament, King Hezekiah harassed by a guy named King Sennacherib, who was the king of Assyria. Assyria was bad news. I mean, really bad news. And um, they were harassing them. They were killing people. They were doing all kinds of horrible things. And so they prayed. And they asked the Lord, hey, we, you know, we, need, you to, we need you to show up here and, and, uh, and do something here. So what, so what happens? Uh, God shows up. In 2 Kings chapter 19, if you want to turn there, you can. 2 Kings chapter 19. It's got to go back far enough. Okay, 2 Kings chapter 19. And here's what happened. The turning point in the whole battle there. 19 verse 35, 36. Turn the page. There we are. That night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. And I love how, matter of fact, the word of God is, I mean, I think this is, this is great. So, it says, verse 36, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I would too. He withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. And, uh, I mean, God showed up, judgment for the Assyrians, 185,000 men, 185, men put to death. The posture of the king changes. He runs away. Judgment's carried out by the angels of the Lord. So that's another way we see them involved. We see them involved in the second coming of Christ, the wrath of judgment and sorts of things. We see that in Revelation as well. So, very basic overview. I understand there's a lot more. Of angels. So, yes, they exist. Yes, they are powerful. Yes, they are limited. They carry out the will of God, the will of Jesus Christ. So, you might wonder, what does this have to do with me? Like, maybe you don't care about angels at all, don't think about it at all. So, what does that have to do with it? Why do I care about angels? That's the final question today. And the main reason I think we, I wanted to talk about this is because just to keep things in perspective, because even in the Christian community, uh, people have gotten the place of angels sort of out of a line. Uh, I've known people who have thought that angels were kind of this mediator between God and man. Or they prayed for them for protection. And we need to be clear that angels are not the ones we're worshiping. We're not the ones to be worshipped, never were supposed to be. That's why I started with Hebrews 1. Because it gives you a clear picture of Jesus as greater, as the one we worship over the angels. Look at the contrast in verses 1 through 4 of Hebrews 1. The sun is the radiance of God's glory. Exact representation of his being. Meaning, Jesus is God in the flesh. Angels can't say that. Angels were created. It says in Scripture, all things were created by the word of Christ. Nothing that was created can say that um, they are sustaining anything. We are sustained by Christ. You are sustained by his word. Every breath I take, every beat in my heart, all of it is because of him. 
Every piece of matter in the universe sustained by his word. So he is the one we worship. Nothing created. We don't create anything worship or worship anything created ever. We need to reiterate this again and again. Why? Because even back in the Old Testament times, when Moses was going up in the mountain to get the, the law from God, what did they do? He goes up and what happens? They create idols and they worship the idols. And it's like, you guys, I mean, you were just brought out of Egypt. You, you have seen God work in powerful ways. And he, Moses goes away and they get nervous and they make gold idols and they worship the idols. It's a common human issue. We get sidetracked easily. We need to keep our mind and heart on the right things. I once met a guy who was praying to a statue and I said to him, you don't need to do that. Jesus is the mediator between man and God. And he got mad at me. And something about this statue helps me. Work. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I didn't quite understand it. But I'm just trying to help him connect the dots. Because how, you know, how dare I presume you're wasting your time when you're worshiping an idol. But, but no angel can save you. No statue can save anyone. There's no power there. So yes, they're powerful beings, yes, but they're not powerful enough to deal with your sin. And that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus Christ came to do. That's why we worship him. So why do I care? I care because I need to worship Jesus and not get caught up in other supernatural things. Even when something looks, whoa, kind of cool, we look to Jesus and keep worshiping him. There's another piece here just to hit on. If you... Uh, Go ahead to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2. There's another piece that is kind of thrown in here by the writer of Hebrews. Hebrews 13 verse 2, he says, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Now, this has created uh, many, many stories. Some of them are... True, some of them are completely made up. Some of them change over time. You know how that goes. You tell the story and it changes and it changes and changes. But here's a takeaway for this, right? He says to show kindness because you maybe entertain strangers. You know, really, the Bible tells us to show kindness whether it's an angel or not. Whether it's perhaps, you know, this angel and we don't want to miss our chance to interact with this angel or it's not. Jesus, remember, we are told that when we minister to the least of these, it's like ministering to him. And so that's our motivation, not so much just to not miss the angels. To be kind, to love people, to do what he's called us to do, to take every interaction and think, you know, I, I need to reflect Jesus in this. So does it change what I do? It shouldn't, really, because we should just be living this way as believers in Christ entertaining strangers, loving people, pointing people to the hope we have in Christ. To listen to the Spirit of God, which prompts our heart and says, give that to them. Go there and talk to them. Pray for them. Encourage them. Go knock on their door and and give them chocolate milk. I've told you that before. That lady did that all the time. She'd go next door and give chocolate milk to her neighbor because he liked it. And she wanted to try to build a relationship with them, and it worked. It's possible that Jesus brings people into our path to teach us things. Oh, yeah. It's possible that he brings us uh, people to shape us and to allow him to minister through us and for his glory and all those things we see in scriptures and whether they're angels or not. We've seen that in the past. If you go in the Old Testament, you see that, people entertaining angels. I'm not gonna get, you can read some of those stories. For example, the days of, of Lot there and angels come and, and uh, there was blessing in that. So we need to learn then and, and understand that even if angel or not, we are showing kindness to people. So what do I do with this? Two takeaways, and then we'll conclude. Well, number one, Jesus is Savior. Nothing else. I know this is a study on angels, and it's topical. It's different than what I normally preach, but um, we need to decide to not worship other things. It doesn't matter if it's angels or if it's our job. I mean, anything. To worship Jesus first. So will you completely surrender to him? 
and be obedient to his word and know his word and study his word so that you aren't caught up in, in just getting blown around in the breeze, as it were. And it's even more so now. You know, there's lots of lots more attacks on the word all the time. People are not listening. People are not caring about it. People are pushing it aside for other things. And so we need to be true to the word. Secondly, understand that all this conversation about spiritual things is a great bridge to the gospel for people. Like we can use our understanding of what the scripture is about angels or whatever to point people to the cross. You know, we, the supernatural is ex- exciting for people. It's interesting to people. So let's talk about it and let's run to the cross because that's what we need. So the Bible talks about angels. So yes, we can believe in them, but we can't get things out of proportion Jesus Christ is who we worship, him alone, and nothing else. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for what you've done in bringing angels among us. We certainly don't understand all of it now, and one day when we see clearly, I think it will make a lot more sense to us what you've done, but we are thankful. Thankful that you have called us, that you have given us... uh, protection and, and just people who are these angels who have kind of watched over in many ways things and been a part of things around us and we are grateful for that. Thank you for your blessing, Lord. Thank you for encouraging us and for reminding us that in the midst of all the supernatural that there is hope in a Savior. We need to look to him. We don't have to understand all the details. We need to just trust in you. So I pray that we would. I pray that our hearts today, no matter where we're at in this room that we would decide to follow you, to trust you, to put you first among anything else, whether it's angels or it's something else, doesn't matter, that we would look and worship Jesus and Jesus alone. Help us to do that, help us in our hearts to do that, and Lord, also for those conversations we may have with people around us who are just looking for answers and hope and trying to figure things out, we pray that you'd give us the ability to communicate the gospel, clearly. Through our actions, through our kindness, through our love, and and also through the words out of our mouth that we would bring you honor in how we approach people. We love you. We praise your name today. Thank you for Jesus, for dying on the cross for us, that we could live forever. So call us in close to you, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.